shown to be have anger and overturn things in the temple. He's also seen to have joy, surprise, disappointment, hunger, and thirst. Very important for the temptation sequence is that he is at the weakest point he could be from a human perspective. 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, and afterwards he was and hungered. And he's able to hold, it seems, all these emotions precisely because he has a human soul and a human mind. It's also important to note that he has a human will. The biblical authors, even like what we see in the Garden of Gethsemane, have this description of how he subjected his will to the Father's will. And ultimately, Jesus' divine will that he had from eternity is already the same as the Father's divine will. And so it must be that he has this also human will that he must bring into subjection to the divine will itself. So why would, why would it matter that Jesus is fully God and fully man? I think the Old Testament and New Testament both are clear that only God can save. As he is the one who is being sinned against, as he is the one who has this wrath, salvation truly can only come to him come from him. So Jesus must be fully God in order to save us. But in order to fully represent us, fully take our punishment, he must also be fully man. Hebrews 10, 2, 10 to 13 says that in order to bring many sons to glory, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. And so he partook of the same things, namely flesh and blood. The uh, early church father, Gregory of Nazianzus, explains this as that which is not assumed is not healed. Namely saying that whatever part of humanity that Christ doesn't take upon himself, he cannot save in us. So if he doesn't have a human soul, doesn't have a human will, doesn't have a human body, then those parts of ourselves cannot be saved within him and within his sacrificial act. More quickly, looking at some of the common misconceptions that we have within history. Arianism uh, was one of the first Christological heresies to pop up, and it essentially teached that Jesus was the first creation and not actually God himself. And so at that point, salvation would be accomplished not by God, which then it couldn't be accomplished at all. This is what is still believed by many in the Jehovah's Witnesses group, But also, Ligonier's The State of Theology survey says that 78% of evangelicals would agree with the statement that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. So this first theological heresy has still been seen as present today. But the Nicaea comes and it specifically counters this by affirming the deity of the Son, affirming that the Son is eternally begotten and not made, and ultimately places a discussion of the nature of Christ within soteriological discussions. Paulinarianism comes next. It affirms the deity of Christ, but it prefer- goes the opposite way from uh, in the balance. It ultimately says that he did not take on a human soul, but just a human body. And so then he doesn't fully be able to save the human nature, and unable to save the human soul, because he does not actually possess it. At the Council of Constantinople, from which we get the Nicene Creed that we would read today, it's the Nicene-Constantinople Creed, Um, there is a church affirmation of two natures within Christ, and that there was a whole complete humanity assumed at that point in time. Nestorianism continues on to say that there is a human person and a divine person that are united at the time of the Incarnation, so that then there are two persons rather than two natures. This is actually the first descriptions that we have of the, the idea of Theotokos, God-bearer, or Christotokos, Christ-bearer, when it comes to Mary, whether Mary is the mother of God or Mary is the mother of Christ, actually came up in this description. Nestorius wanted to be able to say that Mary was the mother of Christ, but not the mother of God, because the persons of Christ Jesus and the pers- the divine nature was a separate pers- were separate persons. So it never it, at first wasn't a comment about Mary, but a comment about Christ. But the scripture doesn't really speak about um, 
two personal subjects, two persons acting and being united, but one person acting through two natures. And so the early church at the Council of Ephesus also denied this particular heresy. One that might be worth spending a little bit more time on, because I think it kind of still permeates what, the way we talk about uh, Christology in this church today, is Eutychianism or monophysitism. So monophysitism comes from mono for one and physis for nature. And so it ultimately conflates the divine and human nature of Christ together to try to make one particular nature out of it. A third type of nature that in, you, in the case of Eutychianism was mostly divine comes into place. The problem is that as soon as you combine the natures together, you don't have, you have a Christ who's not fully God or fully man. And I think today we have a modern example of that in canonic, quote-unquote, Christologies, coming from the Greek word kanao, which means to empty, argue that Christ had to empty himself of divine attributes to become man. Ultimately, he had to lay them aside is the argument that comes. And I think this is something that we've probably heard from in, in this church. I've said it before. It's the way it makes sense to think about it, because we, we have a hard time understanding, well, Christ, the divine nature has omniscience, and the human nature would not. So how can that both be true of the same person of Christ? How can he be omniscient and non-omniscient? We want to figure out how the infinity of, human, of divinity can fit into the finitude of humanity. And it can't. And the biblical authors don't seem to present it so. And the early church said that that's not how we need to view it, that they are separate natures that are united in the person of the divine son, such that he acts in and through each. So, so the implications of the response to this, which was the Council of Chalcedon, is that one nature does some things that the other nature does not do, which is this idea that Christ can have omniscience and can know all things through his divine nature and not know all things through his human nature. Perhaps the most powerful way of looking at this is that this means that the divine son, while he's through his human nature crying helplessly in a manger, is also through his divine nature sustaining that very same manger, holding it together and allowing himself to continue to live there. What needs to be clearly said, though, in order to avoid a, a Nestorian heresy, is that anything that either nature does is still done by the person of Christ himself. What is, um, that is the main new contribution that Chalcedon provides, is this idea that the natures have to be separate, but also then united within the person. But it also provides the box of what we would think of, of what is orthodox to say about the person of Christ. And it describes it as being, you want to stay within that realm of saying Jesus is fully divine, fully human, one person but as two unconfused, in that sense, unmixed nature, natures. So looking briefly um, at what these aspects of the life of Christ and these different end-alls. So first thing is that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He thus then partook of her human nature. Now, the Virgin Conception does seem to be presented in the Bible as being the means by which he could enter in in a little bit of a, a sinless way. Not in the sense that the virgin conception guarantees that he would enter in sinlessly, but if we look, think about it in the reverse, it would seem that a sinless birth would require some sort of miracle. And that miracle is then provided through the uh, virgin conception. There's also then this, this attesting that, that Jesus was fully human but sinless, that he did not have a sinful or fallen nature. And so he was a second Adam who could come and represent humanity and be fully human, so that then ultimately redeemed humanity when we get brought up into him, is able to be fully human without sin. Jesus' death, it's important. We're going to talk a lot about the atonement next week, so we're not going to spend too much time here. But the very fact of his person together allows him to be able to take the punishment for our sins, bearing the wrath of God. 
and ultimately on our behalf, conquering sin and death and the devil forever. And then after Jesus died, he was resurrected again, um, resurrected on the third day, which was in accordance with the scriptures. And it was a bodily resurrection such that there were holes that Nehemiah could see. And then he goes up in the same manner as these things. But it's also interesting that Paul calls it the grounds for our justification. Romans 4.24 talks about how Christ, uh, God raised him for our justification. And 1 Peter 1.3 presents it as the basis of our regeneration. The basis of our regeneration most likely because we are united to him in his suffering like we talked about in Sunday school last, um, last year. And then after he was resurrected, he ascended into heaven in that same bodily form, which is where he currently sits at the right hand of God, serving as our prophet, priest, and king. And then he will return in the same manner as he came to fully consummate his kingdom and ultimately bring us to dwell with him in that same bodily resurrection. So as our last point of discussion, this threefold office of Christ the main overview of this is that the term Christ here, we have a transliteration of the Greek, of the Hebrew word Messiah, and both words then refer to an anointed one. And in the biblical discourse, this term Messiah, an anointed one, is typically referred to as king, the ideal Davidic king that we anticipate from the Davidic covenant. But there's also then an indication that there are three Old Testament offices that are anointed, a prophet priest and a king. And there was an Old Testament expectation that there would be a future one that would fulfill these offices perfectly. And so John Calvin notes this and ultimately also notes that both Testaments speak of Christ as anointed of the Spirit, which also might explain why the anointing is the use in John, 1 John 2.20 seems to refer to the Holy Spirit in the believers. So what is the role of the prophet? The prophet spoke God's words to his people. He came usually with a message of judgment and need for repentance to the people and proclaimed it. And then in Deuteronomy 18, there's an establishment of this, mess, of this prophetic office. But there's also an expectation that there would be one singular prophet like Moses that would come specifically having face-to-face -face communion with God like Moses did and reveal definitively to us who God is. Deuteronomy 34, which is after the death of Moses in the account, says that such a prophet never came. And it points forward to a further anticipation of when that prophet would come. And so when Christ comes, and John 6, 14 describes that people are questioning whether he was the prophet who was to come, there's a description that he fulfills that anticipation and that prophecy. And he reveals God to us definitively. He is the direct explanation of who he is, shedding more light than anything else ever could. And he ultimately speaks his word. And ultimately shows to be the goal of all Old Testament prophecy. So for us today, Christ is our prophet, meaning that Christ should be the center of what we think when we're trying to think about God. We're trying to understand who he is. Christ has already revealed it to him to us. It also means that since we understand Christ through the scriptures, both old and new, that the word of God has to become known as the way in which we are able to know Christ and thus know God himself. So Christ as priest, the Old Testament priest would offer sacrifices. They would take a lamb, they would put the sin of, God's, of, of the people upon him and ultimately kill it on the behalf of the people. It would also praise God or pray on behalf of the people. And it's interesting that most prophecies that are expecting a priest to come that would be fulfillment of this are also connected to the idea of a king. Isaiah 6 is a powerful vision of a king in a temple. Zechariah 3 also has this sign that he has with Joshua, the current high priest, who is given a, a throne and a dominion. And perhaps most significantly to what we remember is Psalm 110, that you will be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
which also has this description of the future Messiah having all of the enemies put under his feet and thus rolling over them. When we get to the point where the New Testament identifies Jesus as this priest, it's described that he himself is the sacrifice that the priest offers. And that then he comes and ascends to the right hand of God where he ever makes intercession for us, as the author of Hebrews indicates. And so I think there are a couple of reasons why it would matter that Christ is our priest today. It means that we don't have a need to make sacrifices for our own sin. And by that, I don't just want to refer to the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. But also think about how Christ has paid the penalty in full. We don't need our own righteousnesses to make that up for what he is lacking. Because there is nothing lacking. It also means that he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. And Hebrews also then says that it grants us access to the throne room of grace. So that we don't have to be on our own when trying to go through difficult times or struggling with temptations. And I also think it's incredibly encouraging to think that the one who knows most what we need, Jesus Christ, is also praying for us, interceding for us, and describing what we are doing, just like he did in John 17, praying not just for his disciples, but for us. And finally, Christ is king. In the Old Testament, kings like David ruled over the people, but they were seen as God's representative to them. To, of, to them. Texts such as Genesis 49 or 2 Samuel 7 seem to indicate that there is an expectation of a, a greater king that would come. And so then, Christ comes, rolls over the church, but his kingdom is not necessarily of this world. But it's more spiritual and it's still to be fully consummated. And so for us, this kingdom, and Christ as the one who's bringing it, fixes our gaze upon the, the right treasure, Christ himself. It faces our, forces our gaze upon not the luxuries of this day, and ultimately provides a motivation for enduring suffering. In the article uh, the, of Institutes, John Calvin describes... For this reason, we ought to know that the happiness promised us in Christ does not consist in outward advantages, such as leading a joyful, joyous and peaceful life, having rich possessions, being safe from all harm, and abounding with delights such as the flesh commonly longs after. No, our happiness belongs to the heavenly life. In the world, the prosperity and well-being of a people depend partly on strong defenses that per, uh, per, prevent them from outside attacks. In like manner, Christ enriches his people with all things necessary for the eternal salvation of souls and fortifies them with courage to stand unconquerable against all assaults of spiritual enemies. Which also means that we have assurance that the king that will never leave us nor forsake us, that will be with us until the end of the age, will supply all that we need for life and godliness to be able to say uh, to us to stand against the assaults of spiritual enemies. And so for summing up why Christology as a whole matters, there's some things that are listed here. I think some of the key ones for us to think through is, A, understanding the person of Christ is given as the rubric for true Christianity. When we're told to test the spirits in 1 John, we're told to test whether they say that Jesus is the Christ who came in the flesh. Ultimately, what we also see is that a lot of heresy from the first, four of the first major ecumenical councils, the first councils of the church, center around the doctrine of Christ and getting it all right. And that tells us, A, that it's important as a line between orthodoxy and heresy. It also tells us that there is a slight means that if we go too far in any direction, we could end up falling into a misstep. And I guess I will actually read all of the so what points here. It also, the fact that this 13-page this handout is kind of inadequate to properly introduce the subject. 
does actually provide a little bit of other understanding that this is complex. The fact that he can be God and man, that he can come in human form and take upon himself our sins, is remarkable. And it should be a very strong reason to worship him, worship the God who can actually orchestrate this to be the case and who's wonderful enough to do it for us. Close in prayer. Father God, I do want to worship you for who you are and what you have done here through your son. That he is perfect God and perfect man, not combining those natures together, but keeping them separate, but united in the person of the son. Pray that you would continue to allow us to see more of who he is and worship him and worship you more because of that. I know that there are many in this room who have known him personally, and I just pray that you would allow us to continue to get to know and experience this knowledge. But I also, Lord, pray that if there are those who haven't had this opportunity, that you would use the preaching of the word today to change their hearts and bring them unto yourself. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.